Well, good morning to you all on this, the first Sabbath of 2022, I think I'm right. <laughs> so on your behalf, it's uh, my privilege to welcome William Mackenzie back to our pulpit uh, today. We look forward to his message and uh, trust you have all enjoyed times with family and friends and we office bearers on their behalf will wish you all a, a very good new year. <clears throat> good morning and uh, a good new year to, to you all. A joyful new year and a joyful Sunday and a joyful Sunday morning. Uh, the reason for us worshipping is twofold. One is that you would meet with God. It's not that you would hear me. And the other reason is that God would meet with you. So are you expecting to see him? It's a big hill, if you are expecting. The psalmist said, I'm looking up. An answer will expect. Now, the call to worship is from Hebrews chapter 10. I think it's, is it coming up on the screen? Or it's not. Hebrews chapter 10. So I think I'll manage to find the book of Hebrews somewhere. Hebrews chapter 10, and it's verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us persevere as we turn to sing Psalm 47, verses 1 to 9, from Sing Psalms, page 62. Page 62, verses 1 to 9. All nations, clap your hands and shout. Clap your hands and shout to God with joyful cries. Call out, how awesome is the Lord Most High, great King who rules the
please join with me in prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. It's uh, one thing to put words together. It's another thing to hear words from somebody else. But it's a wonderful thing for our heart to be engaged in prayer, to calling upon the God who sits above the heavens. You are merciful and gracious and great and eternal and all-knowing and all-seeing. And yet, you hear. You promise to be here. And not merely in this beautiful building, but to be here in our hearts and minds. To visit with us. Dear Lord, please pay us or make with us a New Year's visit. Open our hearts to receive and to worship you. We are to a limited degree aware of how frail and forgetful and sinful and selfish and proud we are. The psalmist expressed that and we would wish to echo his words in our hearts. Iniquities, I must confess prevail against me. They seem to come in and work in our minds and hearts in a way that gives us to question your providence, to question our circumstances. Bring us to do what you do today. You delight in mercy. You make that clear to us. And you invite us to do exactly the same. To meet at the place, at the person, or in the person of mercy. So that we would go into 2022 with the resolve again of the psalmist. God's mercies I will ever sing. We pray for each other. We pray for those in our families who are on our minds. Some of them perhaps unwell. Some of them perhaps anxious. Some of them afraid of the virus, and unwilling to attend the means of grace. Some of them who have no interest in listening or hearing your word. And the, these situations are, are too much for us. We are stuck. We don't know what to pray for for them. We ask that your word would reach them in your own mysterious and sovereign power to awaken the dead and to revive the living. That's an expression we, we can slip off our tongues without realizing that our need of that is great, that you would indeed Awaken the dead. Because all of us were dead. 
in trespasses and in sins. And you brought us into new life. And we pray that you would revive the living, that you would give us the zealous enthusiasm to say with another, he is altogether lovely, that we would be captivated and satisfied by Jesus. We pray for our queen. Thank you for her message last week when she spoke about her personal faith. We pray for our country in these days of neglect of the truth, of thinking that we can manage somehow or other by the policies we might pursue, whereas without you, we can do nothing. We pray for our leaders in church and in state and across the nations of the world, we are concerned about the tension between China and Russia and America, the situation in Iran, the ongoing mess in Afghanistan and large parts of the world. And we have relative comfort and Provision, abundant. Give us to go about our lives learning to give thanks and longing to give thanks. We pray for this morning, this service, that it would be glorious. Not because of how things are said, not because of the fact that we together are here, but because of the fact that you have promised to be here. You know how we often ask the question, who was in church today? Who did you see? Who led the singing? Who was the preacher? But grant that we could say in answer to that question, God was in church today. I heard his voice. I embraced him. Continue with us then. Pardon us for our sins. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, children, um, do you think? Do you ever think? Do you know what thinking is? You do, don't you? Do you think? You think about things. I think we all think about things. You've been thinking already today, and you're thinking just now. What a funny man that is asking me, do I think? Everybody knows that I think. Well, I was visiting somebody recently, and she had a great method for thinking. I said, what do you think about? And she said, oh, well, I like thinking about the Lord Jesus. So have you, have you thought this morning or even this year about Jesus. Anyway, she said, I said to her, how do you think about Jesus? Oh, well, she said, there's plenty, plenty things in the Bible that help us to do that. And do you know the alphabet, she said? I said, oh, yes, A, B, C, D, E, and I went through. She said, that's it, that's what I do. I start with the letter A. A is the first letter in the alphabet. And I say, can I get a word beginning with A about Jesus? A, amazing, isn't he? Yeah, that's right, he's amazing. 
Amazing. Right now, what about, what about B? What can you think of a word beginning with B that describes Jesus? I'm sure some people here can. B, he's big. Beautiful. B, C, creator. D, have you got one beginning with D? You must have. He is delightful. He is the great deliverer. E, you got one? Think you have? Have you got one beginning with E? He is everlasting. F. He's a, what is he? Beginning with F. Have you got one? Have you? I think you do. F, friend. And so she went on. So what I would like you to do is to think about Jesus. And you can do that over the lunch table today. A lot of us spend a lot of time eating with friends at this time of year. We speak about football. We speak about COVID. We speak about holidays. We speak about this, that, and the next thing. Why not speak about something that is of vital importance and great interest? Go through the alphabet and try and find a word that directs you to the Lord Jesus. So, thank you, thinkers. And keep thinking. Now we're going to, we say the Lord's Prayer together, and I think it's up on the screen. So let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And next we're going to read, I think, John chapter 16, verse 17 to 33. Bye there. Bye bye. Be good. And keep thinking. That's good. John chapter 16. From verse 17. Forewarned is forearmed. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean? By a little while. We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more? And then, After a little while you will see me. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. 
In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus answered. But a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone yet. I am not alone, but for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And may God add his blessing to what we've read of his word and help our memories to engage with it and appreciate it. Now we'll turn again to sing in the Scottish Psalter, page 241, and we're going to sing in Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5. In thee, O Lord, I put my trust, shamed let me never be.
In this chapter, we're in the, the Passion Week, and these chapters, the, the previous one, 15 and 16, are the discourse the Lord Jesus had with his disciples on his way to Gethsemane. And I would like to help you to fasten your minds to think on verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. What are you thinking about? What I need to do today? Will I be back in the office tomorrow? What are my plans for any holidays I might get this year? What's going to happen with COVID in 2022? But you have something else that you think about. Something else that gets to you. It's your conscience, friend. And the conscience is God's agent in your heart and mine. We have that verse in Lamentation. Who can heal it? Your wound in your conscience is as deep, as deep as the sea. There are issues in your heart and mine, in your life and mine, in your conscience. Who can heal it? And as you think about that, you know you need peace. As his death approached, Jesus became increasingly focused on stabilizing, on settling, on comforting his disciples in view of the looming crisis. He deals in these chapters with the two main threats to their joy. The two main threats to their joy are that he's leaving them. And he's going to die soon. And in answering their perplexity, Jesus speaks in a way that reaches across time into Dingwall today. Down through the centuries, he comes to us saying, I'm speaking these things to you so that you would have peace. The term, these things, actually appears 40 times in John's Gospel. But we're going to try and confine ourselves to this chapter, chapter 16. And I'm going to pick out six things in this chapter which should help you and I to enjoy in 2022 new, fresh, delightful peace. Verse 1. I'm telling you this so that you won't fall away to keep you from going astray because there is trouble ahead. There is no small print in the covenant of grace. It's up front. Jesus is telling the disciples and telling you that there's trouble ahead. Don't think it amazing or out of the place that you're going to have trouble. Do not think it strange about the fiery trial. Satan promises what he cannot deliver. He promises pleasure, but as you know, they are for a season, and he doesn't tell you that. Here's what Thomas Manton says. If, because you are Christians, you promise yourselves a long time of temporal happiness, free from trouble and affliction, 
It says if a soldier was going to the war, she'd promise himself peace and a continual truce with the enemy. Or as if a mariner was committing himself to the sea for a long voyage, she'd promise himself nothing but fair and calm weather without waves and storms. So irrational it is for a Christian to promise himself a rest here. This is not your rest, and you won't get it with a better career. You won't get it with a better kitchen or a better car. You will have tribulation. You'll see it there in verse 2. Folks are going to kill you. You see it in verse 4. I'm warning you. You need to know forewarned is forearmed. Number two. The Holy Spirit. When he comes. The Holy Spirit is coming. God is saying to you, I know how you feel. I know your sorrow. I know your challenges. I understand them. And I'm going away so that you will have the Holy Spirit. And where is the Holy Spirit? Where is he? I know where he is today. I know where he is right now. He's right here. Right now. Leading us into the truth. Giving us to know the truth. I will send the comforter to you. Or the helper as it's called in some places. As he is called. He will guide you into all truth. In my bodily presence, I'm only with you one place at a time. But by my Spirit, I'm everywhere present. He shall take of mine and declare it and show it to you. I am not departing in exile. I'm going away to my coronation. Here's Calvin. Christ left us in such a way that his presence would be more useful to us. A presence that had been confined in a humble abode of flesh on earth. More useful to us by his spiritual presence. By his ascension, he fulfilled fulfilled what he had promised, that he would be with us even to the end of the world. That's good. Are you agreed? That that's good. That in your bed. In your office. In your garden. In your kitchen. In your family. The Holy Spirit is with you. Bringing to your memory. Bringing to your memory. The things you have learn the thinking you did the thinking you were taught in the Sunday school or wherever it was are your heart is your heart friend warm to see a little of the beauty and glory of divine grace in Jesus Christ I came across a a remark this week from a friend, now gone to glory, R.C. Sproul. This is what he said. If you don't 
see the beauty of Jesus, you're still in the pig pen. You're still in the pigsty. So I'm asking you a personal question. What do you think of Christ? Is he lovely? Is he altogether lovely? Is he your chiefest joy? Is he your delight? If not, you're in the pig pen. And don't think otherwise. Number one, to keep you from falling away. Number two, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Number three, the best is yet to be. Look at verse 20. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Verse 22, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one, no one, nothing, anywhere, will take your joy from you. Notice what the disciples were saying. They're a wee bit like myself, and perhaps like yourself too. We don't understand. We don't know what he's talking about. He's speaking about going away. We don't understand that. Then verse 19. It's perhaps, I don't know. There's plenty of things in this chapter that are wonderful, but there's two of the nicest words in this chapter in verse 19. Jesus saw. He saw what was in the mind. Jesus knows what you're thinking about. He knows what you're thinking about right now. Jesus saw. How comforting that is. All things are naked and open before him. He knows our heart. He knows and understands us. I don't understand myself. He knows the end from the beginning, the darkness from the light. And he's the great teacher. There's a verse in Isaiah that speaks about that in Isaiah chapter 30. It's a beautiful passage about Jesus being the teacher. And it says, your eyes will see your teacher. And then there's a consequence. You know what the consequence is in, in, in chapter 30 there? If you see Jesus, what do you do? You get rid of your idols. The words that are used in the chapter are be gone, clear off, out of here. We've no room for sin anymore. We can't stand it. And the more you're captivated by Christ, the more you will hate sin. And, you know, we're pretty good at seeing the sin in others and seeing the sin in our leaders in church and in state. We're not so good at holding the mirror of God's word against our own heart and seeing that we are sinners. The best is yet to be. It's okay. I know you have sorrow today, but just hang in there. Weeping may for a night endure. At morn doth joy arise. The morning 
It's coming. Heavenly joys, a thy right hand are pleasures evermore. Isn't that, isn't that something that we learn about Christ himself? We read, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He was helped and encouraged and sustained by the joy that was set before him. Are you sustained by what is in your pension fund? Or by the good report you got from the doctor? Or are you sustained by the joy that is set before you? Everlasting joy. Part of that glorious fact about Jesus is joy is this, I believe. His great joy, more joy than you have or more joy than you are able to have as you here today repent. As you say, oh, I've made a mess. And as you come to Jesus and say, have mercy. He delights in that. Who for the joy set before him? And I'm setting before you in a most inappropriate way, a most inadequate way. I'm trying to tell you a little about the joy that's set before you. It'll change today's challenge. It makes tomorrow's unknown completely different. The joy set before you. Number four. It's in verse 23. I'm hoping that uh, when you get time to think, maybe at lunchtime, maybe in the afternoon, you'll go through this chapter. And you'll see these things for yourself. And you will receive that peace that verse 33 speaks about. But verse 23, that speaks about it. Prayer answered. Ask, and you, 23 and 24, ask and you will receive. And your joy will be complete. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. That's amazing. You all prayed that already today, actually. You read it? And many of you repeated the words. Was it in your heart? I don't know. God knows. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. That's what we asked for. Again, I came across a good quote this week, and I've got it here. About, it's from Tim Keller, praying in earnestly for a long time for something he really wanted, but he didn't get it. He didn't get what he was asking for. And this is what Keller says. Looking back, looking back, it was as if God was saying, Son, when a child of mine makes a request, I always give that person what he or she would have asked for if they knew everything that I know. When a child of mine makes a request, 
I always give them what they would have asked for if they knew all that I know. That's great. That's wonderful. If your views seem and you feel and you think that you're asking for something that you're not getting, just remember that he knows what is best and he does what is good for you. Number five, it's in 25. The Father's love. Verse 25. I will tell you plainly about the Father. Verse 25, 27. For the Father himself loves you. There's a funny kind of thinking that we have is that Jesus is kind of twisting the Father's arm to give us grace. The Father longs to give you grace. He is waiting to be gracious. Such pity as a father hath unto his children dear. Judgment is a strange work, we are told. He delights in mercy. The Father himself loves you. God so loved. I like to sing these verses. It's in Psalm 73. Asaph's psalm, the end of it. Yeah? It's wonderful. You go to it, friend. It speaks about his love. Avoid hard thoughts of God. Avoid hard thoughts of his providence. Don't be afraid to come to him. He's waiting to be gracious. Jesus is saying, I don't go to the Father to persuade him. He wants you to come to him just as you are. Empty. Nothing. Nothing. In my hands I bring. That's number five. One more. He has the victory. Verse 33. Is it verse 33? I have overcome the world. Yes, verse 33. I have overcome the world. It looks, doesn't it? as if we're on the losing side. <clears throat> the BBC, it's full of what's against the gospel. Our news bulletins are full of stuff which doesn't do any good to anybody. The schools... The church. What's happening? Well, what's happening? It's, it's, it's desperate. Where are all the 20 year olds? It, it's vexing. A friend of mine was in a church in the center of Edinburgh last week. It used to have a thousand. It had 30. Where, where, what about here? It's, it's lovely. Two or three, it's a wonderful place to be. But there's room for a few more. What's happening? We had a little prayer time next door and one of the prayers was about the need for revival. Revive your work in the midst of the years. 
But he has the victory. And he has promised that of those he has been given, he will lose none. Here's a verse I find comfortable in the, comforting in the midst of what's happening today. It's, it's all that the Father hath given to me shall come to me. Because things are pretty weak. There are congregations of 10, 5, 20. There's a few, a few bigger ones, and we're thankful for everyone. But there's need for drops to fall from heaven. Are you struggling in your mind about your history, your sin, your circumstances, and your family? I will see you again. I have the victory, and your heart will rejoice. You are like him, more than conquerors, through him that loved us. He has the victory. And you wonder, how can that be? Because I'm afraid that one or two of my relatives, or maybe myself, are going to die this year. Maybe there's somebody in the congregation who will die. He's got the victory over death too. I think again, it's R.C. Sproul who said, he stared directly into the face of death. And death blinked. He triumphed over death. There in his death, he bruised the serpent's head. I have said these things to you that you might have peace. Finally then, I'll just go through the six of them briefly. I'm saying these things to you so that you'll not fall away. I'm saying these things to you so that you'll enjoy the Holy Spirit as your helper. I'm saying these things to you so that you'll know things are going to get better. The best is yet to be. I'm saying these things to you so that you know your prayer, your struggling, weak prayer will be answered. I'm saying these things to you so that you will be delighted that the Father loves you. I'm saying these things unto you so that you will know that not only he has the victory, but you have the victory. And then you can say henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. This world is not my home. I am just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Christ executed the office of a king in subduing us to himself and ruling and defending us and restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. He's your king. Therefore rejoice. Lord, we come to you knowing that we cannot adequately understand or adequately describe these glorious realities. We pray for the lonely and the hurting heart here that these things would give to them peace and that we would know something of the joy of the Lord and the peace that passes all understanding. We pray for the congregation that you would provide and guide 
and give them to look beyond the present, beyond the circumstances, beyond the challenges, beyond the weakness, to look to you. They looked to him, and lightened were, not shamed were their faces. This poor, poor man cried. God heard and saved him from all his distresses. Pardon us for our sin, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to conclude by singing glorious things of thee are spoken, and the music group are going to help us with that. grant to every one of us solid joys, the joy that is yours and the joy that no one can take away from us and the joy that is everlasting. Grant that we today would have perfect peace. Thou wilt keep those in perfect peace whose mind whose thinking is of you 
Help us so to do. And pardon us for Jesus' sake. Amen.